Thanks for, for coming. Um, so, as it says on the screen, we're going to talk about Drupal and queuing this morning. We'll start with a slight disclaimer. I reckon all the uh, presenters are going to have a disclaimer this morning about being hung hungover. Mine's about having a bad back, so I'm up to my eyeballs in codeine and ibuprofen. So, uh, yeah, that's that's my slight disclaimer if anything starts uh, going a bit funny. Um, so, my name's Tom Fithian, I work for Capgemini, I'm a lead Drupal developer there, and um, so we've got a big team of around about 30 developers working on, on some pretty big um, projects for clients like Royal Mail and Eurostar, um, and queuing is something we've used quite a lot, so I wanted to share some of our experiences. Um, it's just some of the stuff we're going to talk about, so a bit of an introduction to why we queue for things, how Drupal handles queuing within, within, uh, within Core and Drupal 7, um, and Drupal 8. Going beyond core and how Contrib has been used to, to extend what the Q API does. Um, look at some of the gotchas in implementing queues and then chance for any questions. Uh, I'll let, then I'll let you go and get a coffee. So, everyone hates being stuck in a queue, me included. Stuck at the supermarket, stuck at the post office, stuck waiting to buy your iPhone. But if all those places didn't have queues, then you'd get everyone trying to get there all at the same time and getting stuck in the doors. So this was quite a good quote I found when I was looking at putting these slides together. So queues will form when processes with variability are loaded to high levels of utilization without any constraints. <coughs> so thinking about this in terms of your web traffic, can you predict when your peaks are going to come in your web traffic? Are you going to plan to meet that peak all the time and have zero overhead? Um, if you think about, say, a cafe, um, a cafe's got a choice. It can either hire loads and loads of staff to work at the peaks of the day, have loads of people there at 9am at lunchtime and, and at the end of the day. They can shut the doors and not let anyone else in so they can serve all the staff or they can have a bit of a queue. For a cafe that's a bad thing, but for a web server that's probably a good thing so we can satisfy all our requests. So on a web server, something is going to queue somewhere, whether you like it or not. So as a web server incurs increased load, um, if you're not queuing anything anywhere in your application, then Apache, for example, is going to start queuing threads as, as threads take longer and longer to, to process. Those requests are going to build up, you're going to hit your, your Apache timeouts, and, they, and then they'll be dropped. So whether you, whether you see it and manage it in Drupal or not, um, traffic's going to get managed and, and queued, um, for better or worse. Um, it's going to deal with it, just not always in the way that you expect. So again, maybe you're talking to your database, you've got a long-running query, it's locking a table, database query is going to be queued up behind that, you might then lose your MySQL connection, um, and, and so yeah, everything starts failing. But MySQL is doing its best to, to queue. So do you want to be in, in control? Do you want to make sure that the queue that forms is one that you can manage, one that you know what's in it, and one that you know how often you're going to process? Or do you want an uncontrollable one, like an Apache queue, um, which you can't really do anything about, certainly not from within the Drupal stack. So hopefully, do you want to be in control is a bit of a, a silly question. So fortunately, Drupal, like a lot of things, comes to the rescue. Um, in Drupal 7, queue API was, was introduced to Drupal Core um, to provide a way of dealing with some of these problems in, in queuing traffic um, and queuing requests. Um, it's been backported to Drupal 6, so there's a Drupal 6 module that you can install uh, for Contrib, um, which will also expose the same API, and unfortunately pretty much identical between Drupal 6 and Drupal 7, um, so you can use the, the same code in both cases. So, the core queue API exposes two types of queue. You've got a reliable queue and a non-reliable queue. So, a reliable queue is one where the order of the messages going into the queue is preserved, first in, first out, um, and it guarantees that every item is going to be processed at least once, and your, your processing logic is going to deal with, with what happens to that, that item. A non-reliable queue does best efforts to make sure it's going to be processed in the order that it was added to the queue, um, but you have a chance that the order is not going to be preserved or that items might get lost. So a non-reliable queue, for example, would be an in-memory queue, so if the, if the server turns off or if your web server restarts, you, you're going to lose what's in memory and you're going to lose those queue items. So generally used for stuff where you're not too worried about success or failure. Um, but also the advantages of that are that if you've got uh, multiple, multiple things writing to the queue and multiple things reading from the queue, then you, you've got much harder, much faster writing times um, when you're not worried too much about 
the order of the items. Um, so something like uh, an email queue might be a good example of where you could use a, a non-reliable queue. You might not be too worried about whether every email gets sent. In some cases, you are going to be. But you can, you can write that away and then just let the, let the process run. So the queue API provides the interface to common queue functions. Um, as we said, we've got a memory queue within Drupal, which implements the queue interface, which is the non-reliable queue type. And you've got system queue, which implements the reliable queue interface. Um, system queue in, in Drupal 8 has been renamed, and it's a lot more meaningful, database queue. So basically, the system queue or database queue is a table in Drupal, which stores the items that you've written to the queue, and all your API functions are interacting with that, with that table. Um, in Drupal 7 and Drupal 8, it's worth pointing out that the batch API uses queuing to manage its items. So it uses the system queue, database queue, to store what you've added to the batch, and then batch API is iterating through that. So a lot of the code we're seeing here is, is fairly similar to what batch API is doing under the hood when, if, you, if you've used that in the past. So if you're wanting to look at the code and, and look at how it's implemented, where can you find it? So in Drupal 7, it's part of the system module. Um, so you can look in module system, system.q.in, and that's got all the um, Q methods there. And that's actually, in that file, you've got um, all the classes. So you've got the class that exposes the two interfaces, um, and you've also got the, the two implementations of that, the system queue and the memory queue. In Drupal 8, um, the um, auto discovery uh, for the PSR0 means that we've now moved that into the core lib folder. So it's core lib, Drupal core queue, and then again, following, following the Drupal 8 conventions for one class per file, um, we've got a file for the memory queue the database queue and the batch queues. So what does a queue API actually let us do? Well, we've got these seven um, methods. So we can create a queue, which fairly obviously set does whatever the, uh, the implement implementing class does to create a queue. Um, for a database queue, that's actually nothing. It doesn't actually need to do anything in the database table. All, your, all, the, all the create queue effectively is is a name you know, in a column in the database. Um, but for, for different queue implementations, create queue will set up in the back end queue, queue system whatever needs to be created to set that up. So for um, Beanstalk, for example, which is a, a queue back end that we'll talk about a bit later, create queue will, will create a queue within Beanstalk so that you can then start creating items. So that takes us on to create item. That does what it says. Again, pass some data to it. It will send that data on to the queue back end that you've specified and we'll, we'll store that for reuse later. Claim item is then when you want to come to process your queue. Um, so claim item will go off to your queue backend, will say give me the next item from the queue. Um, and you can also specify what's called a lease time on a queue item. So you can say to the queue, I want to claim this item and I want nothing else to be able to claim it for the next X number of seconds. So by default I think it's 30 seconds. So it'll say I've claimed this item, item 3. I'm going to use it for the next 30 seconds or however long I think it's going to take to process that item. And then it's going to release it. Um, and, and let other, other threads pick that back up. So that means that you've got the ability to say only one thing is going to process this queue item, but if something goes wrong in the processing of that item, it won't just live there forever. It's going to be released back and let another thread pick it back up. And that ties back onto release item. So if you've finished with an item before the lease time has expired, you can call release item on it, which will set that, that, le that lease back to zero and allow other processes to pick it back up. So release item will leave an item in the queue and allow it for reprocessing. So that's a bit of the opposite of delete item, which, as it sort of implies, removes the item completely from the queue. So that's effectively you've finished processing. And we'll look at the, the scenarios where you, you want to use either of those two um, a little bit later. Number of items, not all queue backends support this, but number of items is tell me how many, how many items I've got in this queue. So it's good for monitoring, good for understanding how much stuff's got stuck in your queue and whether it's processing correctly. Um, so in number of items for uh, the database queue, that's effectively select star from queue, where the name is equal to the name of the queue that you want to process. And that's all it's doing. It's just, sorry, select count from queue, where the name is the queue that you want to, to look at. So it's just, just looking at the database table. Um, again, different backends, we use different reporting means. Delete item we've covered, and delete queue will say delete the queue and delete any items that are in it. Um, again, that's fairly terminal to, to whatever you've been processing, but, but can be useful sometimes. Just, just to be clear, so <coughs> a claim item is 
re release hours are basically unclaiming an item, is that the... That's right, yep, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so you claim it, you do some work on it, maybe, and we'll look at this in, in a second, we're going to go on and look at some code. So you, you claim it, you do some stuff on it, maybe you're checking the data that's in there, maybe you're checking whether a remote system's active. If it's not active, you might want to release back to the queue so it can be processed later. Um, if it is active, you're going to send it over there and then delete it from the queue. Um, and we'll, we'll look at some code. So um, fortunately, Code API, hiding away all the back end, makes it really easy to work with the queues and really consistent regardless of what your queue back end is. So for creating a queue, first line here, Drupal queue get, and then the name of the queue. So whatever you want to call your queue, that will go away and construct the queue to make sure it's, it knows what class, what queue class it's calling, um, and, and how it's going to interact with it. And then queue, create queue, will just set up that queue data. Again, like we said, for uh, the database queue, that doesn't actually need to do anything. Uh, for the Beanstalk, it might go away and set up a queue, item in, uh, a queue structure in Beanstalk. Two things here we're looking at the create a queue item and the count the number of items. So again, all we're doing is we're saying, go and get my queue, make sure I know how I'm going to deal with my queue. We're going to set up the data that I want to put on the queue, which is just an array of any data that you want to send over to the queue. So you can, you can put absolutely anything you want into the queue data. It's basically just a bucket of, of stuff that's going to get processed. And then you just call queue create item and send your array of data over to it. And that will, that will create the item. So talking about database queues, that's going to do an insert into the queue table, setting the queue name equal to my queue in this case, and putting the serialized array of your data into the data column. Then again, count, count the queue items. Maybe you want to know how much stuff's in your queue. Um, again, very, very simple. Get your queue and then call the number of items. Does, does, when you create items, does queue data queue always data. have to be an array? Can um, be an object? Or? Uh, it, good question. It will serialize whenever you send it. So you could actually send an object, yeah. Um, <laughs> Sorry? Objects are arrays of yeah. basically. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that would, that would work. Uh, and I think you can actually send it a string and it will serialize the string and unserialize the string, okay. So the email body or, or something like that. But regardless of what we're doing, if we're looking back at the data we sent here, we sent an array of stuff equal to test. And here we're checking if we've got an item, so if, if the response from claim item is, is true, um, and if the item data stuff is equal to test, then we're fine, everything's happy. Whatever we've done, we've processed correctly, so we can now remove that from the queue. So we can call delete item on it, pass that item in, and that will remove it from the queue. What triggers that process? Which one, sorry? The, the calling the, the queuing of the item back to the process. That uh, this there. process queue item function. Yeah. I'll come on to that in a second in, in how, that's, how, that can be, how that can be called. Um, there's, a, there's a few different ways of doing it. Um, so basically, if we're happy with what we've done when we're processing our item, we delete it from the queue. If we're not happy, let's release it back to the queue. We may, in some circumstances, if we're not happy, we might want to delete it and requeue the item on a different queue. We might want to create an error queue, for example. So you could sort of duplicate your create item um, functionality that we had before. And here we could do queue, queue get, error queue, and then queue create item and pass the item data over, then we've got a way of knowing if things have gone wrong. Depends whether we want to know about the stuff that's gone wrong or whether we want to leave it there so we can try again later. So there's then a hook that's provided by Core, um, hook cron queue info, which lets you expose your, your queue to hook cron for processing. So here you've got the name of your queue, the worker callback is the function that we had on the previous slide, which is what, how do I want to process my, my queue items. And time, not the least time, but time is how much time do I want cron to spend processing this queue. So in this case, we're passing 60 seconds um, into hook cron. So every time hook cron gets run, someone runs cron PHP, um, or, or you've got whichever of the multitude of, of ways of running crons you've got set up, every time cron runs, 60 seconds will be spent on processing this queue. One of the things to be careful of when doing this is that hook cron will always delete the queue item that it passed to your worker function. So when you're processing it, you want to make sure that you're handling any errors within your worker callback 
to make sure that if, if stuff fails, you're either requeuing it as a new item, or you're moving into an error queue, or, or you're handling it however you want to. If you want everything to be deleted, if, even if it fails, that's fine, just leave it, leave it, leave it as it is. There's then a module in Contrib called QUI, which I'm a co-maintainer of, uh, which provides a slightly different hook, um, which it, it aims to, to go a bit further than what the hook <coughs> cron Q info does, and it's just hook Q info. It provides, again, our cron callback, so this, this provides and still provides the mechanism of how do we want to process our items on cron, but also lets us provide what functions do we want to call when we're, if we're processing this queue in a batch. And QUI, I'll, if we get, depending on how time goes, I'll show you some, as a quick demo of it. But QUI lets you go into your queues, inspect them, and either run a cron to have some items processed, or run a batch which will process the queue as a batch. And so we process a certain number of those queue items just by clicking a button. So if stuff, maybe you've got stuff being processed by cron, cron's running only once a day, and you get a sudden surge of whatever it is that you're processing, you could run batch open, the, the batch process to, to speed up the processing of your queue. But there's other ways of running queues as well, so we'll come up to those. And basically that's it in terms of code that you're, you're going to need to write to process queue items. Um, obviously you might need to, to put more error checking around it, you might want to talk about error queues and, and requeuing stuff depending on success or failure. That's, that's all sort of stuff that regardless of how you were processing whatever it is you were going to process, um, you'd have to write that anyway. So QAPI just, for, for a very few short lines, um, provides quite a lot of power um, around making sure that your, your items can be queued, requeued, and, and processed carefully. So just looking beyond core, we've already mentioned um, the backport to, to Drupal 6, so the Drupal Q module uh, on Drupal.org is exactly the same API that we've just looked at, but for Drupal 6, so you can, can do all the same queues there. Um, I've mentioned Q, QUI, which provides a way for um, inspecting your queues, looking at the amount of items in them. Um, there's some additions to it coming up that will, for a database queue, will let you actually inspect the items that are in that queue. Um, if you were using uh, a, th a third party queuing system, then those tools would be provided by whatever queuing system you were using. There's the examples module, which is, <coughs> is great for, for all kinds of examples about what Drupal can do and how to implement it in code. There's a sub-module of examples called Queue Example, which exposes Queue API, provides a form that lets you play around with, with adding items to a form, creating new queues, and looking at what happens when you claim an item and, and, uh, and, and requeue items and release items. Um, so that's, that's a really good way of having a look at how stuff, how stuff goes. And again, if we've got time, I'll, I'll try and show you that. And then there's different Queue backend modules. So there's the Beanstalk module, which provides a Queue class for uh, interacting with Beanstalked. There's a stomp module which I'm the maintainer of, which um, lets you use Queue API with any um, Queue backends that implement the stomp protocol. So that's things like ActiveMQ, RabbitMQ, um, and, and there's also other Queue, queue engines that, that let you use um, stomp with it. And then there's a Redis Queue module, again for using Redis as a, as a key value store for, for your Queue data. Um, and there's other backends as well. Um, I didn't want to list them all here. So I've talked a few times about custom queue backends. Um, and the great thing about queue API having been implemented as a class is that we can extend that class, we can override it, and we can implement that class um, ourselves to create custom backends. So how does Drupal use these backends? So there's two variables um, for setting default classes. So there's the queue default, default class variable, which you can set in comp if you want to set it as a permanent override, or if you've got something that at some point um, changes what your default class is, you can use variable set. Um, so the queue default class is, is system queue, um, and also the queue default reliable class is system queue. So you might want to say, for a non-reliable queue, I want to default to stomp, or for a reliable queue, I want to default to, to system or database queues. Um, really, really depends on, on what your use case is and, and how you want to treat that. More flexibly, you can override queue classes for an individual queue. So you can set queue class underscore the name of your queue and set that to whatever queue class you want to implement. And that will then start using that API when you're calling, when we're, when we're doing Drupal queue get. That's looking through the variables. It's going to check, have I got, so that my queue here is called my queue. <coughs> it's going to check for queue class 
my queue. If that variable exists, that's the class that we use. If it doesn't <coughs> exist, then it will use um, the default <coughs> class variable. And so you can set that to queue class, queue name, it could be stomp queue, it could be Redis queue, whatever custom backend you've, you've implemented. I'm sorry if you've already set this for sure, yeah. what, What's the difference between a reliable queue and an unreliable queue? So a reliable queue will enforce the order of queue messages. Yeah. Um, so it will be a first, first in, first out, and it will, it will guarantee that. And um, it will guarantee that every message gets processed at least once. So it's a persistent queue. Mm -hmm. um, a non-reliable queue would be like an in-memory queue. Um, it might only hang around for one page request or, or might be stored in memory somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, so if that, if that memory is lost, then that queue is lost. Um, so it doesn't guarantee that it's going to be so processed. It's yes, exactly, exactly. So it's, yeah, persistence and non-persistence is really the, really the main thing. So if you restart the server that the queue's on, you'll lose it if it's a non-reliable queue, but it'll be, for example, written to a database if it's, uh, if it's a reliable queue. So we looked at um, the fact that there's two hooks that we can use for getting um, queues to be processed via um, via cron or via batch. Um, if you're familiar with Drush, um, you can use Drush. So Drush is a uh, command line <coughs> shell and scripting interface for Drupal. It provides you loads of commands that you can just run Drupal stuff on the command line. So you could run uh, Drush download and then a module name, and that will download the module from drupal.org. Uh, you can enable modules, disable modules, run all sorts of stuff, and you can write your own commands um, for, for being executed as, as Drush commands. Drush 5 <coughs> provides us two, two commands for processing queues. So Drush queue list will go off and look for all of the queues that have been exposed by hook cron queue info and hook queue info, um, and will give you a list of all the queues that you've got. Drush queue run, followed by the queue name, will then use the worker callback from either um, hook queue info or hook cron queue info um, to, to process your items again using the, the time that's been set in those hooks to process it for a certain amount of time. In the same way as running with, with hook cron queue info, use Drush queue run with, with a bit of caution because again, queue run will always delete the item when it's finished with it. So if you want to release, releasing is still going to get deleted, so re queue it, actually add that item back to the queue or add it to a different queue. Um, if you're wanting that to be processed again. You can also obviously write your own Drush command. So actually a project that I'm on at the moment, rather than using um, the, the provided Drush commands for, for running queues, we've actually written our own command where we can pass in the number of items that we want to be processed by, um, how, long we're, yeah, yeah, how long we want to process it for, uh, what to do on errors, so whether we want it handled or not. So we've got, there's a lot of flexibility in exposing your own Drush commands. So what, what triggers a queue to run when other than Drush, I mean, I mean a cron job, a cron hook, but... Mm. So, so the cron hook um, will, will run um, whenever cron runs. Um, so by using Drush queue run or creating your own queue processing Drush command, you can then run that in, use cron tab or, or another task scheduling package to run that Drush command regularly. So one of the patterns we use is we've got um, queues which are um, managed and, and run on CronTab. So we've got queues that want to be processed every couple of minutes. We don't want to be running hook cron every couple of minutes because that has its own problems. And actually I really dislike hook cron um, in general, uh, which I won't go into here because I'll be here all day. But um, So we have these, these cron jobs that are just on CronTab on, on, on Unix, so you can use Windows Task Scheduler if you're using a Windows box. Um, we'll, we'll execute that Drush command every two minutes process the 50 items that we tell it to run every every two minutes and that, and that way we'll get you through your, your queue. So it lets you have that bit more granularity about saying I want to run this queue every two minutes, all the other queues can just run on hook cron. So it gives you that, that flexibility. Um, and it, if you were sort of then going on to do it in, in production environments you could have things like Jenkins could trigger your queues, so you could still you could, you could use Jenkins to be running a queue every five minutes or every ten minutes or however often you need to, to do it. Um, and, and Jenkins will obviously log the output and, and let you have visibility on what's being done, uh, which can sometimes be tricky depending on how you set up CronTab and stuff like that to do it. And particularly if you're using Drush Cron, um, sorry, Hook Cron, um, then, then knowing what's happened is, is sometimes difficult. So some of the things around.